it is difficult to answer all questions and um, I said that already, <laughs> but I'll, I'll say it again. There aren't, there often aren't short answers, uh, but we'll do our best. And uh, this presentation is actually quite short, um, uh, so we, we, should, we should have more time for questions after this. But I wanted to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Um, just to explain Creative Commons for those who aren't aware, now I know um, we've, we've given so many presentations on this that we sometimes feel everybody knows all of this already, but if you haven't heard of it, um, it's an organization based in California and uh, it, uh, it, it builds on existing copyright law and it, 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 uh, it builds on the notion that some people might not want to exercise all of the extensive rights which they have from copyright, as Louise mentioned. Um, so what it provides is the option of what's called some rights reserved as opposed to all rights reserved. So copyright says all rights are reserved in, in a work, but Creative Commons says, well, I'm only going to reserve some of the rights rather than all of them. Um, so as, as Louise mentioned, we are the Irish partners in that uh, organization. Um, the focus in Creative Commons is on content rather than software. Uh, so if, if you're in the software field, it is not recommended that a Creative Commons license be applied to it. Um, so if a person decides to use a Creative Commons license, they go onto the Creative Commons website and they answer a few questions about the nature of the work and what kind of restrictions they want to apply to the work. Uh, so in this example, the, uh, the person has actually chosen the Irish license. Um, now, this is under version three. Uh, technical point is that under version four, uh, there isn't the option anymore of choosing uh, national licenses. But uh, anyway, for the, for the moment, let's say for the sake of argument, somebody decided to go with the Irish license under version three. Um, they would um, answer questions like whether they want to allow modifications of their work, whether they want to allow commercial uses, and so on. And then uh, it will generate a license as, as it says itself, and then you apply the license to your work. And there are various types of license. Uh, there's lots of information online about these types. Uh, the, the, the freest type of license is the attribution license, or the buy license, as it's called. Buy just means that uh, if you use the, if somebody reuses the work, uh, they must uh, credit the author. So if I took a photograph and I put it up on my Flickr site, and I apply a CC buy license to it. Uh, it means that I'm allowing other people to reuse it as long as they say that it was taken by Darius Whelan. And this actually happened to me. I, I took a uh, picture at a Creative Commons conference in Warsaw, and uh, I discovered that somebody was reusing it. One of the speakers was reusing a picture of herself. She didn't have to email me. It's very, very important to understand that. Uh, she didn't have to look for my permission because I had already given her permission by applying a Creative Commons license uh, to my photograph she could use it without any fear of litigation from me and without any need to request my permission. Um, so that's the way it works. Now, you can impose restrictions. Uh, when I first started using Creative Commons licenses, I used to actually impose a lot of these restrictions. I found then over time that really uh, there wasn't a need for a lot of them. So I actually now would recommend to people, if you're, if you're going to put your stuff up on the web and make it freely available, um, you might as well just use the freest one, which is CC BY. But uh, you can include the more restrictive ones. You can say that people can't use it for commercial purposes, uh, and so on. Uh, I won't go through the various types, because that, that's kind of for separate presentations. Um, if um, you're looking for work, somebody came up to me only yesterday and said, I want to use a picture for a poster. We have various posters for advertising our courses. Uh, where do I go? You know, it's a standard kind of question. Um, so what I normally say is, to go, I recommend to people to go to Flickr. Um, now, you can go to Google Images and so on, uh, but uh, let's, let's just say, people like short answers to things. So short answer is go to Flickr. There are millions of photographs on Flickr. Um, and what you need to do is go to the homepage of Flickr, flickr.com, F-L-I-C-K-R.com, Put your search into the search box. So I, the search box is over there on the right. I put a red circle around it. Um, 
So I've taken a sample, search for a castle. You want to put a picture of a castle on a poster or in your classes. Search for castle. Um, once you search for a castle, a, a large number of pictures will come up, uh, many of which will actually be copyright without Creative Commons. Uh, th th they'll be standard, they'll have standard copyright licenses. What you need to do is then click on advanced search. Now unfortunately you can't click on advanced search from the start. You have to do your search first uh, because they like to keep their website simple, you know. So do your search first, ignore the results you get, go straight into advanced search now that the advanced search button has appeared. Um, then one of the options when you scroll down the page um, is to only search for Creative Commons content. And I would normally tick the next two boxes as well, which is uh, th to find content to use commercially and find content to modify, adapt, or build upon. You might as well. Th th that basically means that you're going to find the freest of all content. And assuming you find a picture which suits your purposes, you needn't worry then about ever using it commercially or ever modifying it uh, because you, you, you've chosen one of that type. Then you find the picture you want, and on unfortunately this is a bit clunky, uh, you have to, the picture you want will appear um, and then in the options there'll be three dots which if you hover over it will say more. Uh, sorry, it's not my fault, it's Flickr's fault. Uh, it's a bit clunky. Um, so uh, you, you click that, those three dots, it says more actions and then you download the picture. Uh, so finally you've got there. So search for the word click advanced search, tick creative commons, and then click the three, three dots for more in order to download the picture. Um, so now, now that you have the picture, what I always do then is I save it with the uh, author's name in the title. Uh, so I go uh, Castle by Mary Jones, there's Mary again, Mary Jones um, CC by From Flickr. And that's actually my uh, title in my, so if I'm ever reusing it, it's, it's just there. Um, so, th so that's, uh, th those are the basics about how to find a Creative Commons image. So what we need to do, ideally, is transition to, if we have old packs of slides which we use a lot with classes, we need to look at the images that we use in them and see can we find a generic replacement. And quite often we can, um, a, a Creative Commons replacement. Because if, if you have a picture of Blarney Castle, for example, for some reason, uh, you, you'll probably find that somebody else has taken a, a picture of Blarney Castle. The, the one that you took from Google Images is probably copyright, but uh, there will be another one on Flickr which is not copyright. There are various other places you can look. Um, Google Images has an advanced search, for example, which allows you to uh, look for Creative Commons um, content. I, I've always found that Flickr is, is the best, personally, but these will evolve over time and they will get better. Um, Bing, I think, has it as well. Uh, so th there, there are lots of options, but I just wanted to raise awareness because most people don't realize that you can actually do this. Um, that that there, there, there's a wealth of images out there, but don't just use, the, the, the habit that most people have, understandably, is just to go to Google Images, find an image, and reuse it. You have to try to get out of that habit. Uh, and also, the next step is you must be sure to put the credit into each slide. So once you do it, once you get into this habit, again, it's just a, a change of work process. Uh, it, it becomes normal. Um, so I've given an example here. Um, this is where a person has a, a picture of a woman opening her arms to opportunities. And um, that's, there's the picture, but you'll see that there's very small print here. And that's where the person has included the uh, credit. Because one of the conditions of Creative Commons always is you must credit. Because the person who's giving you the work for free, um, the least you can do is credit them, because that's what, that, that's what they're asking. Um, and some commercial photographers actually do this. Um, it's not just um, amateur photographers like me who do it. Um, so you can put it in quite small print if you wish, uh, as given there. Um, uh, alternatively, you can... Um, actually perhaps include a slide at the end of your sli slide pack in which you say that the uh, licensing information um, <coughs> is available in the notes section of the slides. You know, there are various technical ways you can do it. This guy, Matthias Klang, actually 
uh, does it this way. So what, if you download the PowerPoint file of, of his slides, you will then find it in the notes. You'll find the credits in the notes of each slide. Um, okay, any brief question on that, the finding of the images and so on? Yeah? That's separate from copyright law, luckily. Uh, so uh, I will be referring briefly, just very briefly, to privacy, for example. Um, the, uh, the short answer is most lawyers, in the case of people, people appearing in <coughs> photographs, um, if they're identifiable, most lawyers would say you should get what, what's called a model release, which is the permission of the person appearing. Uh, in the case of actual uh, physical buildings, uh, there isn't a need generally for permission. Um, it's, uh, it's not an area I specialize in myself, but I mean, I, I have, I've heard people say things like, oh, UCD campus is copyright. I remember when I was in UCD. UCD campus is copyright. You can't take a picture of UCD campus without uh, permission. But from my knowledge of law, that's not really correct. Um, I'm not sure what the UCC position is. Yeah, it's, we, we don't copyright our campus anymore. We don't attempt to, quote, copyright our campus. So the, my understanding is you can take the picture of Blarney Castle without the permission of the owners. Uh, but with people, you probably need a, a model release um, if they're identifiable. Um, and UCC has a standard um, model release document. Um, well, a, a, a release document in general which covers everything, including the model the reason they call them, they talk about model is that it originated in the idea of using a model in an ad to, to advertise something. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about the idea expression dichotomy, which Louise briefly mentioned. Um, uh, she didn't mention, uh, for reasons of time, that there's actually a specific subsection in the Act which says the copyright protection doesn't extend to ideas and principles which underlie any element of a work, procedures, methods of operation, or mathematical concepts. So that gives some, that puts more flesh on the, on the principle that um, expressions are protected but not ideas. Um, so we can say then quite clearly that principles aren't copyright and if I may be so bold, I can refer briefly to some US case law with the normal caveat that US law is quite different from uh, UK and Irish law. But in the US they have held very clearly that facts aren't copyright. Um, and and so, for example, they've held that historical facts are, aren't copyright. Um, and, and so I think uh, pro probably a similar approach would apply here. What do you think, Owen? Ish. Uh, possibly a similar approach would apply here. Um, and cer certainly whatever about historical facts, what we can talk about, because the Act says it, is that principles are, are not copyright. Um, and in the US as well, they use what's a notion which is called the merger doctrine, which is that if a fact can only be expressed in a particular way, um, then, then that expression is not necessarily copyrightable. So this is a matter for um, teasing out in case law, perhaps over time. But the reason I, I mention it is in terms of um, education. If, if you're merely reciting facts, you could at least attempt to to rely on the principle that, well, this isn't an expression, this is only an idea, or it is only a principle. I also wanted to emphasize the, the issue of incidental inclusion, which Louise briefly mentioned. Um, if you only incidentally include something uh, in your work, then that, that isn't uh, copyright, or, or at least it's not an infringement of copyright. Um, so, um, one example I think uh, where that would apply might be, say, if you had a book cover uh, which had a work of art on it, um, which um, was um, for which the author had received copyright or for which the publisher had received copyright. Well, let's say um, you took a picture then of the person uh, who wrote the book or some other person holding the book. Um, the, the work of art is now only incidentally included in the picture. Um, it's, it's quite small too. They take account of things like that, that it's, it's only a small part of a large picture. Um, uh, there's a case ongoing, according to the media, about the love-hate <coughs> program, where a work of art was in the background during the program. 
and uh, the, the, owner, the, the owner of the copyright and the work of art is asserting copyright there. The defence will argue that that's incidental inclusion, um, but the plaintiffs are arguing that uh, it was quite a dominant work of art in the series and it appeared numerous times so that it went beyond incidental inclusion. And there is US case law uh, which, which says that uh, you can sue in, in those circumstances. Um, I wanted to briefly mention other areas of law as well, uh, just to, for awareness raising rather than actually addressing them. Uh, uh, but you should be at least aware that there may be issues regarding the use of trademarks or patents in, uh, in digital teaching and learning. Um, so Louise briefly mentioned patents before, um, and um, many of you will be aware of the idea that invention can be patented, uh, and the rules are very, very different as regards patents, much more uh, uh, restrictive, um, and no, no fair dealing exceptions of the same nature as the ones that apply to copyright and so on. So if there is an invention involved, um, then you would have entirely different considerations uh, in, in reusing a material. Um, data protection could have some relevance as well. Um, if, if the content you're using involves personal data about identifiable individuals, uh, then the reuse of that is governed by data protection law as well as by copyright law. So you need to be very cautious about, for example, to take a, a very random example, say a list of names of students. Um, if you took a, a photograph of that list of names of students for some reason and included that in your slides, um, you would have copyright in the photograph because you took the photograph, but there would be major data protection uh, implications in, in publishing that. So they, th th that's an entirely different area, but you should just be aware um, of its existence at the very least. And someday we'll do um, a 50-hour module in which we cover all of these things. Um, privacy then as well, uh, uh, which I mentioned uh, briefly already. Privacy is a constitutional right, uh, and it's, it's also a fundamental right under EU law and, ECA and European Convention on Human Rights Law. And so anything which in, uh, involves a uh, possible invasion of people's privacy would obviously be governed by uh, the law concerning privacy. That, 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 that's, those are very brief sentences on what are very complex areas of law. Um, and these slides were included, um, uh, f but I'm, I, I've decided for reasons of time that I'm, I'm not going to dwell on them at the very least because they're not as relevant to teaching and learning, they're more about research. Um, but for those who aren't aware, linked with the Creative Commons movement and the whole idea of of making work more available and sharing it with the rest of the world is the idea of open access publishing. Um, and so uh, I wanted to just raise awareness briefly that uh, one way of dealing with the problems of copyright law is if researchers uh, and teachers uh, chose to make their work available on a, on a more open basis, there would be uh, less of a problem then with reuse down the line. Um, so the, in these slides, I talk briefly about that, for, and as, as we said before, these slides will be made available later. There are now open access policies in the UK and in Ireland which uh, require, uh, or at least purport to require, the use of open access uh, publishing uh, for publicly funded research. And so that's going to change the whole nature of the reusability of material. If it is published on an open access basis, uh, using, for example, a Creative Commons license or a similar license, then it's going to be easier in, in the long term for people to reuse it, whether in an educational context or in another context. Um, a, a little bit about software as well. Um, even though, as I mentioned, Creative Commons doesn't cover software, there are alternatives. For those of you in the software field, you can use free and open, soft, open source licenses regarding uh, software. Um, so, for the sake of completeness, I wanted to mention those. Um, and there's a website called OSS Watch, which provides uh, guidance on licensing of free and open source software. Um, and 
uh, in terms of sources that you can look at uh, for further information regarding copyright, um, the, 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 the kind of Bible in Ireland of intellectual property law, which includes extensive material on copyright, is Clark, Smith and Hall on intellectual property law in Ireland. Um, then in terms of a, a, a very useful website is um, the JISC legal website, um, which is a UK website, obviously, so you do have to bear in mind that there are significant differences, and, and these differences will be becoming wider shortly, regarding um, our, be between Irish and UK law. But still, it's a, it's a very useful resource on ICT use in education, research, and external engagement. There's a book as well by Jane Secker on copyright and e-learning. Uh, again, it's a UK book, so you do need to bear in mind the differences. And I've included a quick screenshot of the JISC legal website uh, just to show its, its extensive nature. Um, and, uh, you know, in the, in the menus there you have legal areas. Copyright is only one of many areas on which they provide guidance. Um, and it's a pity that we don't have a similar service in Ireland, um, perhaps, perhaps in due course the National Forum and, and other similar bodies will, will help to set up something of that nature. Um, so any, any questions there?